Welcome. Thank you all for coming here today to DigiTrek 21. I just want to open by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the lands on which we're gathered here today, the Kumbamari people of the Yungamber language region, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and any First Nations people here with us today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Nicholas Eloisa Shearer, Grayson Cook and Alinta Krauth, our artists on our panel here today in discussion with curator Bradley Vincent. I want to do a big thank you to TAFE Queensland, who've been working solidly for nine weeks now on this incredible program, everything from blockchain to women in tech and everything in between. And another shout out goes to uh, Study Gold Coast for supporting today. There will be a link available after the event for anyone who wants to share the experience, the discussion, and at the end we'll have Q&A both from the audience here and also from those out there in the digital land. Um, so thank you, let's kick start. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Renee. I welcome everybody here and online. As Renee said, my name is Bradley Vincent and I'm a curator here at Potter Gallery on the Gold Coast. Uh, today we're going to talk about digital art. Um, I guess it is worth saying at the beginning that what we mean by digital art is an ever changing and expanding field. Uh, digital technologies are constantly innovating and developing, and so the art that comes out of them is constantly changing and developing. We have with us today um, three artists who all work in digital modes, uh, and we'll do so in really interesting different ways, which I think is what I'm really excited to hear about today. Um, I'm going to start with an intro of each of you, just a quick bio for some context, and then we'll jump in to talk about your individual practices. And then today we might open things up more broadly to talk about the online world, the digital world, and sort of the social implications of it. So first of all, we have Alinta. Alinta is a multidisciplinary new media artist and a researcher in interactive art in what she terms more than human situations and spaces. Much of her work involves ecological themes and scientific fieldwork alongside ecology experts and wildlife organisations. She's exhibited nationally and internationally and is currently featured in the new Hodder Gallery with a commissioned interactive work in our children's gallery space. We will talk about that this afternoon. Uh, joining Elinta is Grayson. Uh, Grayson is an interdisciplinary scholar and a media artist and the chair of creative arts at Southern Cross University, just over the border. Uh, Grayson has exhibited and performed at major galleries and festivals internationally, including the Japan Media Arts Festival, WRO Media Art Biennale, and the Image Science Film Festival in New York. He has also published widely in academic journals. Um, you gave me a lot of reading content in preparation for today, <laughs> Grayson, thank you. Um, and thirdly, we have Nic Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas Aloisio Shira is an artist and independent curator whose practice is concerned with digital conditions of contemporary life. His practice engages with the cultural functions of imaging technologies and examines many examines how network cultures make use of the history of representation. Um, though he's often taking his work is often takes real world forms such as sculpture or painting, uh, but it's very much embedded in the ideas of the online world. So to kick things off, a phrase that caught my eye um, when I was first starting researching Alinta is this idea of more than human. What do we mean by the idea of more than human? Yeah, well, so it's a term that actually sort of comes from philosophy and the arts and humanities. Um, and these are, these are generally areas where when, when we're thinking about culture and we're thinking about community, um, it's very human focused, it's very human centric. And I think where, where the, when we start to think about what's going on in the world at the moment, we're starting to realize that um, when we think about culture and community, we're not just thinking about people. And we're not even just thinking about people plus their technologies. We also have this wider community of the environment, of plants and animals, even if you live in a city, even if you think about the grounds of Hodda, which, you know, um, you might think that humans are the only ones that are here, but we're not, you know, and and although we make a lot of the decisions, we're not the only ones making decisions. Um, you know, there's, think about mycelia under the ground making decisions about where the grass gets to grow nicely and so on. Um, so that's when I think of this term more than human, and this feeds into my work, 
Um, I'm interested in how digital technologies can be used to um, maybe in an artistic way, maybe in a real way, build bridges between us and other species. So that's kind of it. It's so interesting. I love this idea that um, the concept of more than human traditionally meaning sort of moving into larger animal and plant and sort of mineral world now can encompass this digital space as more than human as well. So there's sort of two meanings going on. Um, why, what was this, the starting point for you to choose digital media as a platform to explore those ideas? Yeah, um, I think that this sort of digital age that, that sort of occurred, I guess, mainly in the 80s and 90s, and now it's just sort of embedded in everything. And I think it's important to think about how we can now use these technologies for good, if that makes sense. Um, you know, what can, what can we do with these technologies to think about the world and to think about how we can actually help beyond sort of ourselves and this idea that digital art is somehow sort of navel gazing or something like that. Um, so for me, I think the fact that digital technologies can allow for interaction uh, and engagement and doing that in different ways to allow us to perhaps build more empathy in a way that we might not be able to with other art forms because digital art can be so participatory. So, um, so for me, it was really this sort of thing of, of taking two things that seem very different from each other, the sort of digital world and this natural world. Because of course, when we say digital, there's still this idea that oh, there's digital and then there's like IRL, like, oh, in real life, you know, digital is not part of it. Um, but now with the internet of things and robotics and all this sort of wider field around digital art, um, it's actually seeping out into the world and into the environment. So, um, yeah, for me, that sort of, that kind of interaction with the world is really interesting. I think something that we'll see today is that this idea of, IRL versus digital online um, just doesn't hold anymore. Um, there's absolutely that crossover. Mm -hmm. um, I like that we've always thought about, not always, but long thought about art as activism. Um, activism increasingly takes place online. So I like this practice of yours that is art as digital activism, digital art as activism. That's really interesting. Um, seeing it at work in the gallery at the moment is great. Um, so you were commissioned to make a brand new work for the Hodder Children's Gallery. Um, people who are here today, if you haven't seen it, you can go up after and check it out. Those of you who are online can come and visit us. Um, it's up for quite a few months yet. Yeah. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the basis of that work and how it came about? Yeah, so um, the work that I have in Hodder at the moment is a, is a sort of large, these large interactive screens made for children um, where children can... Um, use their bodies to sort of design what's happening on the screen. And the story behind it actually is um, at, at the time that I was, um, at the time of the 2019 and 2020 bushfires, I was living quite close to Binnaburra, that sort of area, and um, we were evacuated. And it was a very, you know, strange time, those bushfires and, um, uh, our, our house was fine, but uh, in the months after that, I was um, working a lot volunteering with um, wildlife organizations to go into the areas near where I was living and, and look at um, who, who was still there in terms of the wildlife because they had been absolutely decimated. And so um, we, were, we were looking at, you know, who's gone, who's eating what and this sort of thing. And so um, I found that really affecting. And so I started to just have this kind of really sort of out there thoughts of, of like, what could we do that's just really, really strange in order to help wild animals in bushfires? And I started thinking about, you know, weird designs of like, could you put PPE on a koala somehow? <laughs> You know, could you create a little thing that goes around its neck that senses smoke and just goes Whoop, <laughs> over its face or something? And I sort of thought, well, these are crazy ideas and they don't really make sense. 
but I started to think about how important that sort of um, thought process is of getting people thinking about designing the future in, in a sort of a, a out there way. And so how that feeds into this work at Hoda is, uh, Hoda, sorry, is the idea that can we get children to start thinking about designing futures for our wider, more than human community in, in a creative way? So um, children will come in and they'll stand on the different floor spots and do different movements. And what they're actually doing is they're, they're putting these sort of biological masks onto the animal faces on the screen and they're sort of designing them themselves. Um, but it is funny, and, and I'm, I know you're probably going to bring this up later, that it all, the look of it is quite different now because of COVID and it's actually affected the way that we could make it and what we had to do. So, um, yeah, so it was a very interesting process. And maybe we can dig into, I think people will be interested, what is that process for you? Like how much of your work is sort of collaboration and what, do you, what is the start of your process? It seems very um, richly illustrative in person when you see the projections. Mm -hmm. Is that the starting point of your work? I think for me, I'm different to other people in that I'm not very collaborative. I just do it all. Um, I just kind of sit at home and, and I'm a bit of a hermit. <laughs> and um, so I just um, do it all myself. But for me, um, it's, it's a conversation with the technology. You can't uh, you know, go to a gallery with an artwork made for VR and say, here, can you play this, if they don't have the ability to do that. So this was really a, a conversation with Hotter from the beginning in terms of how, how is the technology essentially going to make this come to life. So for me, um, I use uh, game making softwares and this was made in a games design software and alongside that yeah I, I just do a lot of illustrations um, and in this particular work it was uh, also a lot of creative commons um, images from the public domain that have been painted over to give them all a sort of my look um, that is kind of all put in there together so so um, I I that you kind of half half. You start with the idea of yes, it's got to be it's going to be illustration, but I've also got to think about what's it going to look like at the very end. So um, yeah, it's sort of it's kind of technologically deterministic in that the technology really gets to decide in a way what it ends up looking like. And I think there are some artists who don't don't like that idea, um, but I've just sort of completely given into it the the idea that yeah, the technology will will have to be the main deciding factor here. I think that's that ability to um, constantly upskill yourself in technology as well, I would imagine, to keep, oh, yeah. to go, I'm embedded in this, I can do this. The benefit of a solo practice in that realm is that um, yeah. you are still in control, that you're in control in collaboration with the technology. That's really interesting. And you constantly feel like you're only a beginner. <laughs> and that, so I think it's okay for anyone out there just getting started if you feel like a beginner, it's okay. The rest of us are also just beginners because as the software changes and so on, or, or entire softwares, entire ways of, of showing work just disappear, like with Flash, and suddenly you've got to start again from scratch. And so, um, yeah, it just depends on whether you have the time and energy to do that, I think. <laughs> the fortitude. <laughs> yeah. um, Grace, we might move on to you. Um, I think you're an obvious next step along the three of you because there is like an ecology at the center of your work as well. Yep. Um, yep. But for you, when I look at your work, it seems to me that the interest is data and patterns and sort of the science of um, systems. Um, where did this interest start for you? Or how did the practice begin in that area? Yeah. Um, now, I do think that this concept of the more than human is has been running through my work for a number of years. You know, I, I'm a I'm a media artist, but I did a PhD in kind of critical and cultural theory, and I started out doing cyborg theory, um, and so Donna Haraway and her concept that we're all cyborgs, really. We you know technology and the human are imbricated fundamentally, and then you know these days. 
Donna Haraway is one of the core authors in this field broadly of new materialism that looks at nature cultures and the really complex interaction of you know human beings and cultures with the broader world and so um as uh, as as an academic who thinks about this the 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 porosity between the human and and, and everything else i i guess i turn to doing art science work as a set of languages and tools and modes of representation and modes of inquiry that just seem really a rich way to kind of point my finger at again that kind of more than human extra human the the, the wealth of time and phenomena everything that exceeds us um as much so i, I guess as you know as much as I, I i love a good narrative film it seems to me also problematic because we always put human beings at the center of our narratives and you know i'm i again i'm probably not about to watch a 90 minute feature film about the rocks but i you know I, I make a lot of work with the rocks and i love the rocks and i've spent time at the national mineral and fossil collection at geoscience australia in canberra and you look at this astounding mineral life that they hold there and I want to, and I do, kind of tell artistic stories about that. So I guess geoscience, for example, which is probably the main scientific language and set of tools that I like to work with, for me, that's about storing the world. My task, in a way, is to story geoscience and geoscientific languages and tools. And so I seek to do that. I, I, I use these these scientific modes of inquiry and I, instead of finding or exploring them for a kind of instrumental purpose to find, to find you know, the truth or, or a fact about this or that, my, my criteria are aesthetic and emotional. So my, my, my task I feel is to bring, you know, image and sound and sensual experience to what would otherwise be um, often a fairly dry, you know, scientific inquiry into phenomena and I, 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 I want to propose that these phenomena are mind-blowing and that we should think about the life of the rocks and, and, and the complexity of the clouds. A, because they're beautiful in and of themselves, but B, because we are forces that, that affect these things now. Yeah. Amazing. For those who aren't familiar with your practice, could you maybe describe physically how, what is the outcome of this in your artworks? Like what kind of works are you making? So yeah, for the last few years, I've worked um, a lot with Geoscience Australia in Canberra, and I work a lot with their satellite data, which is um, run from the Digital Earth Australia program, which is an enormous data cube. It allows you to conceivably time lapse any part of Australia over the last 40 years. So 40 years of satellite data, the entire continent stacked. Um, so this is this enormous database. It's stored on the, the, the NCI, the National Supercomputer in Canberra. And my first major work using that, yep, allowed me to time-lapse Australia. I, I, I would delve into um, the last so many years, depending on which satellite you access, that kind of defines the, 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 the periodicity of, 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 of data that's available. But it allowed me to like time-lapse the channel country up in Queensland. And I'd, I'd always known, you know, we have this idea that the tropical rains come, the, the rains come down from the north, they filter through the, through the channel country, they end up in Cutty Thunder Lake Air. We know this phenomenon, every now and again we see it on the news, but time-lapsing it from a satellite, from a NASA Landsat satellite, and seeing this these enormous dendritic river systems kind of pulse with life and pulse with water um it, it absolutely did my head in because i saw this this vascular system of the country in a way that i'd never seen it before and that work um it also uses the music of the next beautiful meditative you know reflective sound and it uses the paintings i, I do aerial macro photography of the paintings of um Mullumbimby artist emma walker whose work is abstract, but is highly reminiscent of the Australian landscape. Lots of kind of salt pan, desert kind of 
forms. And so I kind of run those things together, satellite images of Australia, time lapsing, and these kinds of aerial, aerial imagery of, of Emma's paintings and processes, which are very earthy and landscapey. And we, we sit in between those two things. Um, and the next kind of allows us to meditate on that, on, on the forces that shape the earth, large and small. Amazing. Um, quite a few times here you've talked about um, different organizations that you work with or pull data from or different artists that you work with. Collaboration seems really central to you. What's it yeah. like as an individual artist working with sort of these large other organizations with a very different technological background? Yeah, look, I, you know, I, I, I love collaboration. Um, I'd say most of the, the work I've done is a collaboration in some form, either often with a sound artist um, or, or with a scientific agency. You know, it, it took me a little while to kind of get through the door with Geoscience Australia, a few knocks, you know, emails kind of, you don't know if these things are going anywhere. I'm completely outside their normal purview. Um, it took a little while. But once I, I don't know, I, I said, I'm coming to Canberra. I have a thing to pitch to you. And eventually I got through the head of this, this Earth Sciences Agency and, and, and they let me in. And then we had a meeting and, and that was great. They saw what, um, what I was proposing and, and saw that here was someone who wanted to kind of, you know, I'd pursue their objectives by other means. You know, and one of the things we can do as artists is kind of do science communication by other means. Uh, and of course, we then add these all these other layers, aesthetic, emotional, you know, sensual. Um, and so they, they were just fantastic. And they, they trained me up on how to access and analyze and, and process satellite data. And um, it, it's been a, a, a great relationship because they've been extremely open to this recontextualization of what they do. They recognize that I am, yeah, furthering a number of their, you know, tasks and kind of priorities, mm -hmm. but I get to recontextualize it to audiences that would otherwise never have a clue what Geoscience Australia are or do. And, and that seems pretty valuable as, as a role for a kind of scholar artist. Amazing. I think you'd really, you do like narrativize nature in a way. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. super interesting. Um, Alinta, earlier you touched on COVID, um, and Grayson, I wanted to talk to you. Um, I know that during COVID, sort of time you spent at home when you probably would have been normally teaching in real in real life, um, you kind of threw yourself into numerous different projects, and you started a section on your website that was titled COVID, where we could see the things you were up to and the things that you were experimenting with. Yep. Um, can you talk us through sort of what COVID did to your practice? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, I had all this teaching and really lots of events, I had conferences, just, just spent months cancelling everything. And then we all got locked down and, you know, here I was. Um, and I've, I, one of the projects that I'm doing with Geoscience Australia is called Path 99. And it um, takes satellite data down this kind of stripe, like a transect that runs right down the middle of Australia. Path 99 is an orbit of the Landsat 8 satellite. And um, so I had all this data from, from that kind of transect that I wanted to access and process. So lockdown gave me the opportunity to process ridiculous amounts of data that I'd been planning to try to find a programmer to batch process. So that was one thing I did. Um, the, the other one, the other main one, which also forms part of the project, is um, I set myself the task of getting my head around accessing and processing data from the Himawari satellite, which is the geostationary satellite that um, BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology, used for our weather. It sits out 35,786 kilometers from the Earth. Um, it sees 42% of the Earth's surface. It shoots an image of the Earth every 10 minutes. It records reflected electromagnetic radiation in 16 separate bands, including all of these incredible water vapor bands, which are thermal infrared. It allows you to basically track the movement of water in our atmosphere across the planet, the water cycle. And that's what I did. I, I discovered that I had access to all this stuff, which is sitting on the NCI. And I worked out how to process these really strange data files. 
and I spent hours and hours and hours downloading and processing the stuff so that I could time lapse the the, the water cycle around our our hemisphere. And again, it was just this um, mind blowing moment to see this this kind of phenomenon emerge out of the data. And again, I guess I was processing it in a way that the scientists don't really do because they don't need to. They, they can extract it and they can use it for forecasting or what have you, but they don't need to make beautiful real-time time-lapse images of the entire Earth using thermal infrared bands. Only, only, only an artist would really do that. And, and so that, that, was the, that was my COVID lockdown task. So good. There, isn't, there aren't many bigger narratives to tell than the the water cycle of the planet. This is um, the livability <laughs> of our planet. Yeah, yes. Great. Um, we've all, I think, probably thought about a lot the impact of COVID on our practice. Our industry was particularly hit um, and changed by it. Um, and it's changed the way that we consume media, but also how we make media, how we try and share our art with other people. Um, so just a very broad moment, I guess, to reflect on if there's any specific thoughts you have about our new post-COVID art world lives? I think, I, I know for me, um, I was making a lot of art uh, before COVID that's meant to be touched by people and just having to completely rethink the idea of that. Um, and, but I think something that's maybe nice about the situation is it's, taken us back to this sort of 1990s idea of, of bringing the art into your own personal space of your home via your computer or via your own phone. And so rather than this idea of, of going out into um, public to see art, which of course people want to do that for the experience, but there's something very different about having it in your personal space and having those sorts of one-on-one -on -one connections that, that might be different there. So, um, so I like the idea that we get to play around with that now, um, but certainly from a, a more sort of technological viewpoint of, oh, what do I do now that, that people can't touch the art anymore? Um, so, so that sort of thinking about can we do things in a, in a more sensor-based way rather than having touch screens and these sorts of things. Um, that's what it did to my practice, but, but I think that there are interesting things now that we can do when now that internet art um, is becoming a, a, a trend again. Yeah, so I feel like way. it was a very, uh, before that, a very niche Certainly, if you go back to early internet art and network art, it was incredibly niche and almost forgotten. And I think it was still forgotten. People would talk about internet art last year like it was a brand new thing, <laughs> which was, I think, what you're alluding to with that return to the 90s is like, no, this has been around for a while. Yeah. So hopefully a chance for us to revisit some of that. Yeah. Um, and it got, people got over it. People thought, oh, internet art is, is a thing of the past. Yeah. But um, now... You literally said post-internet art, right? I know, <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's not, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll find out, I think. I think it's going to take a little bit longer to figure out what, what people really want mm. from art through the internet. Yeah. Maybe we'll just move on now to, Nick, your practice more broadly. Um, we've mentioned the internet and your practice is soaked in the subject matter of the internet. Um, if you live a lot of time on the internet from looking at your work. Um, but like I said in the intro, your work takes a physical form in a traditional gallery. So often it's sculpture or it's printed image. Um, it looks like photography, but it's in that space. Or it's even tapestry recently. Um, I'm alluding there to your last show at Metro Arts in Brisbane. And it's a really good example of your practice and how it relates to the internet. Can you talk us through the general idea of that exhibition? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that particular exhibition, um, I kind of took the, the figure of uh, the goblin as like a folkloric um, creature. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't sound connected to the internet in any way, but they're kind of, you know, at times benevolent, at times um, malicious kind of creature um, that uh, kind of act unseen and 
um, kind of mess people's lives up in, in whatever way. Um, and, and a recurring, uh, yeah, creature th throughout cultures and throughout history. Um, so kind of took the, the idea of the goblin um, to, to think about how images and um, how, how us as kind of people are on the internet and interacting with each other through the internet um, are really kind of affected in ways that we aren't conscious of by images. And I'm particularly thinking about memes um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, how memes draw from uh, the, the history of, of, of images and um, of things like painting and uh, photography. And that's, that's where the, the bulk of my uh, practice kind of stems from. Um, so the, yeah, thinking about the goblin as the kind of in the internet era as, um, as something that kind of exists or is enacted through, through memes. Um, so, you know, some of these things that have actually quite a lot of like power and um, ability to affect our lives, as we kind of saw in um, the election of Trump and the uh, kind of massive uh, explosion of memes that like uh, about Trump and like that were pro-Trump that, uh, you know, his supporters kind of called meme magic. Um, so this idea that images are, are kind of magical. There is this kind of uh, folkloric power to to memes and to, to images more broadly. So thinking about the, yeah, the goblin traveling through the internet, messing people's lives up um, and uh, kind of using, using a lot of different kinds of technologies in a very, uh, I'll say DIY, um, a very unskilled perhaps way uh, to, uh, to, to make that kind of material again. So there's all these like processes of um, like analog to digital to analog to digital to analog going on in my work. So a lot of that comes through in um, like 3D printed uh, sculptural elements um, and machine drawn drawings um, that were often appropriated from uh, popular cultural images um, of things like goblins, along with um, kind of uh, images of uh, like still lives um, from the kind of Dutch masters um, and this idea of uh, kind of mortality that goes along with them. Um, and so there's a, yeah, a bit of a kind of, I guess, a tension of the, the lived experience of the world and our kind of digital and image-based experience of the world going on. Um, and that's where I see the, the, the goblin playing. And so the, yeah, these tapestries of still lives um, and which is a bit of an anachronism. Mm -hmm. Still lives aren't actually like, you know, they're not historically a, a topic or a genre of, of tapestry. Um, and um, other things uh, like 3D printed silicon sculptures that were um, the process of which I'd taken from um, like Instagram videos, you know, where people do like 30 second craft, um, kind of videos on how to how to make something and they were taken from sex toy um production that like diy sex toy production so there's this weird kind of like uh yeah central physical um online engagement happening um is the goblin as a little figure to trace um a way through that what was happening there yeah yeah it's fascinating combination of the folkloric and the confusing digital world mm. um and the way images circulate um, you talk also about sort of ideas of representation and the history of representation. Um, and I wonder if you think that the, well, what does the internet mean for the future of representation as, in, as a platform? Should we be optimistic about it? Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, I think in a lot of ways we should be. Um, there's, and you know, there's kind of a lot of concern uh, when I, you know, I was a kid, I kind of raised on the internet. I was maybe, maybe that first generation that, um, like, you know, from, from like five years old was networked to the rest of the world and was seeing images of things I probably should not have been seeing. I was, you know, very affected by those things. Um, and the, I think the internet in those, those days was a, a much more anarchic kind of uncontrolled space, which was really exciting, but also often terrifying, um, especially for a child. Um, but there, there is, I think, um, I do have an optimism about the internet because it, um, 
there is, a, I guess, space for um, niche ideas, niche um, kind of content to, to happen um, and to kind of feed off itself, but also a space for, um, for people to, to kind of interact critically with images, even though we're kind of constantly looking at videos and uh, photographs and um, you know paintings even online through through feeds um, which are you know a particular kind of like endless scroll of images there is I think a really um, kind of fruitful and um, a kind of a lot of artists especially who are using using like the format of the meme um, to, to disseminate their work really widely. And, and um, I think what's exciting about that is that it, it often evolves from what it initially was whenever an artist puts it out there, or not even artists, but there are kind of these, like um, thinking about on Instagram in particular, there are these kind of, uh, excuse the word, but shit posting groups. So people who kind of are um, provocative for the sake of being provocative, but what um, they have like, you know, kind of, 30 or 40 people all posting from the same account. So nothing is logical, nothing seems to make sense. Um, but to me, that's actually very exciting. Um, and and often it, it has kind of actual political or um, economic force in the world. So like, the, you know, there's some people on Instagram in particular who um, you know, generated um, a lot of funds for particular uh, kind of progressive uh, political parties in their countries through through the kind of following they got from from memes and virality, yeah. And that sort of the decol decolorary, the word I'm looking for, corollary on TikTok would be trap houses, right? Mm. As political movements, yeah, for ill or for good, depending on your political <laughs> persuasion. Um, all right, we can't talk about digital art without talking about NFTs, um, non fungible tokens. We probably won't do a massive explainer on what they are. Most of our audience is probably familiar with them in some way. If you're not, there's a wealth of writing out there. I just wanted to throw out a quote that I think kind of represents my point of view on them uh, and just call it out there for discussion. So this is from Jen Bartel on her Twitter um, that says, NFT art, the worst parts of capitalism plus the established exclusionary practices of the fine art world repackaged and disingenuously touted as, re as revolutionary for independent artists, all while, all while tech bros buy them to diversify their crypto portfolios and recklessly expedite climate, climate change. Um, we'll start with you as the F NFT expert. <laughs> is, Jen, is Jen right? Yeah, I think at the moment, absolutely. Which is not to say there's not potential, again, this is my internet optimism, um, potential in the NFT world. Um, the idea that artists might be able to kind of get resale value. So there are kind of smart contracts, they call them, that go along with the sale of NFTs. So whenever it changes hands, you know, however millions of dollars as they're going for at the moment, um, the artist is automatically kind of sent a percentage of that sale, which is really wonderful and something artists have been fighting for for decades in the art market. Um, and that very rarely happens. So that's something that's very positive. As they, they know, the ecological impact of um, blockchain is enormous. I think Ethereum, which is the blockchain that most NFTs are, are traded on, has the um, yearly energy uh, consumption of Portugal. So it's, it's enormous. Um, and you know, there are crypto tokens, which are taking on um, kind of less energy intensive modes of transfer and um, renewable energy sources, but uh, it's very early days for that. The content of NFT works is also, it's just kind of, it's juvenile most of the time. Um, Beeple, who's the $69 million, and again, that is a rude joke, the people who pay for that, <laughs> it's a very particular joke. Um, the, that, the content of that work is, it's like insults written on Trump's dead body, which is like, you know, it's like it seems to be like politically progressive, but it it does nothing, and it's kind of um, it's yeah, kind of juvenile humor, um, which is a problem. Um, I think the interesting thing about NFTs is that they are part of this enormous financial um, system, which is which is exciting and and strange and incomprehensible to most of us. 
Um, but there is, at the moment, no one that's really engaging with the fact that they're part of that system. Like there's like, uh, I, I think a lot of potential for it, like conceptual artists in the 60s and 70s, um, like, you know, were really critical of the art market and the, um, the kind of financial system that it, that it was, you know, entangled in, the kind of capitalist um, system that artists benefit from and contribute to. Um, but then they would they would critique that with their work. They would try and move outside the institution. That's where land art came from, all those things. Absolutely. So this could be an example of another way for artists to move outside of the institutional system. Absolutely, which is exciting and it makes you know land art is some of like the most incredible work we've ever seen. Mm. Um, and like artists like uh, Lee Lozano, um, you know, got a government grant, and the work was to put half of that into the stock market and to you know, speculate on the financial systems that they were kind of you know, profiting on and contributing to, which I think is really, is really interesting and um, you know, brings us back into, you know, if there's, yeah, there's not really any work that's bringing us back to look at the systems by which NFTs are distributed, which is where I see the potential in, in it, yeah. Any thoughts on NFTs? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know that my work doesn't personally engage in, in NFTs um, yet. I mean, you, you never know. Um, but I can also see how um, in, in the sort of current climate for, for digital art, you can see how some digital art, artists would all be sort of clamoring for a, another way to make money. So, um, yeah, I think it's 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 a bit of a shame the current situation with the the ecological cost of of doing something like that. But I think these things can evolve so quickly anyway, and it could be that in six months' time NFTs look quite different. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's very true. I think we're at the very start of something that none of us know what it will become. From my point of view as an institutional curator, I think the best way that we can support digital artists is to commission them to make work. <laughs> um, and then we don't need to um, yeah, data mine and kill the climate. Yeah, um, exactly. Until we get to that point, we'll, yeah, we'll just keep commissioning work, I think. And it cuts out a certain type of audience as well, unless mm. you know how to purchase it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's just purchasing it for the sake of saying that I own this, yeah. which is a whole other, yeah. <laughs> it's a rabbit warren and we're not going to have time. <laughs> um, we'll continue this conversation after. Um, to wrap up, because we are getting close to time, I guess my kind of question would be about the future of technology. Um, sort of Grace and someone who works in um, higher education, I mean, this context of a TAFE um, week here, what do you see the future of technology? What are you excited about? What's on the horizon? What are your students amazing you with? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess, you know, the concept behind today's talk is about digitality. And I guess, you know, a lot of the reason more and more artists will end up being digi digital artists in some fashion and using digital technologies is because digitality is a kind of great leveller in that it is the, it's the thing that enables um, convergence and interoperability of multiple forms of media, you know, languages, data. Um, it, it, it's the thing that, that often um, merges, say, you know, or, or allows for kind of um, porosity between the human body, which produces biometric signals which can be digitized and and translated and sonified and, and visualized and what have you and so you know the the digital kind of enables this remarkable crosstalk between parts of the world and and you know forms of expression and i guess what excites me and what I'm starting to see my students do is pick up on that. You know, I've just been doing this, this unit kind of, you know, new media theory and practice unit. And I've got a student who went out and bought this kind of, um, he's bought a bunch of heart rate, blood pressure, galvanic skin response monitoring things. And he's doing experimentation with 
the effect of green space on his, you know, his kind of excitatory signals that he's able to measure and he's moving between, you know, home and the green space. And, you know, I've never had a student do this kind of biometric monitoring, experimental, you know, data visualization kind of thing. And that's because these, these, these tools exist now quite relatively cheaply for, for a student to just buy them. Um, that's what excites me, that, that, that we're seeing more and more cheaper, accessible technologies that are doing remarkably complex things um, and that allow for seeing, acting upon, being in the world in new ways. You know, that, that's terribly exciting. And if, and if that can yeah, be a phenomenon within higher education, that makes my job more enjoyable. Yes, yeah, incredible. Um, some, you guys, anything about the future, future tech that you're excited about? Or what do you want to work with next? <laughs> oh, geez. Um, I think that um, sort of endless progress as a species is sort of not sustainable. And so that this idea that the future is going to be more and more kind of tech savvy, um, I think it will be, but I, I, I think similar to Grayson, I think that um, we're going to have to figure out how we do that in ways that, that make sense and, and are sustainable. And, and that is a lot of that I think will be linking technologies um, into the environment, into making our cities and spaces greener and better places, um, and how artists can be involved in designing those spaces and, and designing um, a future that makes sense for everyone. Um, I think something that excites me, and it's not even a very new technology, but um, I have a dog and um, I see a lot of people now online who are interested in trying to communicate with their animals via press buttons and so on, teaching their dogs how to speak sentences by pressing buttons and different things and so on. And, and I look at that and I think, well, if my dog wants to go outside, he tells me and he doesn't have to press a button, I know. Um, but I, I really like this idea of the, the potential future of communicating beyond the human realms. And um, actually just last night, I watched a video about, um, I can't remember what it was called now, but it, it re research into decoding rat language um, using um, machine learning. And I've recently been experimenting myself with using machine learning um, with fruit bats. To, to look at fruit bat language and, and sort of converting that into um, a digital artwork based on what they're saying. Um, and so I, I like that sort of sense that the future of technologies could allow us to sort of have, have these whole other potential languages that, that we understand and, and empathize with beyond sort of the human world. So increasingly more than human, I think that's a really great aim for technology. Yeah, technology to be sort of Dr. Doolittle, I think that, that, <laughs> would, be, that would be very cool. So, uh, all right, we are getting close to the time, so we won't throw out to the floor or the internet for any questions. If not, we will just keep talking. It's also fine. <laughs> I think I have more questions. There was like a note of caution. Oh, we've got Ruth over here. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Grayson, this one is, is for you. I'm interested in that um, connection between art and science and the way that you do collaborate and work with um, scientific institutions, organisations. Um, can you give us an example of where you've uh, potentially um, highlighted something that they've never seen before or has your art ever um, 
made a discovery or anything like that. Um, I was looking at your work and um, you did a study on um, water quality and those types of um, really interesting, I suppose, um, we all live and um, exist around water, but we often might not think about the quality or the impact of sudden rain events and those types of things. And to have that visualised um, is quite um, thought provoking. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly that work. So we've just had an exhibition at the Northern Rivers Community Gallery in Ballina, and it was working with my colleagues in art and science and historian and, and Indigenous historians as well. And um, yeah, we did a kind of big data visualisation of 18 months of water quality monitoring data in the Lower Richmond catchment. And um, yeah, it, 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 it was all these little water quality, you know, kind of paper swatches that had just received sediment and then they can be analysed and what have you, but we photographed them. And then I used the, the data that, that records like turbidity, you know, a measure of the dissolved sediment in the water and pH and oxygen levels and what have you. And we used that to kind of pull out, <coughs> excuse me, um, to pull out some of the, the richness in the data and um, and, and it turned out that our data showed Cyclone Oswald passing through the catchment, um, passing through, well, bringing enormous volumes of mud through the catchment. And, and, and you saw that in the information visualization, really, um, you know, in, in, in a very exaggerated fashion. So it did touch people very strongly. It, it made them look and think about the stuff suspended in the river in a very, very tangible way. And the scientists, well, you know, my, my colleague, Amanda Raquel Pachette, who's the marine or, or ecotoxicologist that I work with on that project and others, as well as some of the other scientists who came by, yeah, they, they really appreciated it for the way it pinpointed in a very accessible, immediate fashion, the kinds of things that would otherwise sit in graphs and would be dry and people would kind of peer at them and go, oh, you, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of exaggerated and recontextualized and just made very stark the, 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 the phenomena that were there. Um, and like Geoscience Australia, I don't, I look, I, I, have, I can't say I've made a scientific discovery necessarily, um, but with the Path 99 project, I've got seven years of cloud data down this transect of Australia. And then I, and I, I grabbed all the data, the kind of average cloudiness data that, that NASA record. And they record that data again, in order to filter the clouds out of the data, geoscientists don't like clouds, they get in the way, you can't see the earth. So there are these algorithms that filter them out. And my project is about kind of filtering the clouds back in. But through analyzing this cloudiness data, I was able to see that over the last seven years, um, the, the, the clouds were, were kind of evaporating and we saw these cloudiness levels absolutely plummet in 2019, Australia's hottest and driest year on record, the year that gave us the catastrophic bushfires. I didn't really know that the data was going to have that and the scientists wouldn't. I work with invalid data. I work with cloud data that the geoscientists get rid of. And so, yeah, through doing this, unexpected, remarkably true, relevant stuff can emerge. And, and that, it, but that, that's only going to emerge because an artist said, let me rummage through your database of junk data and find some value. And so I did. Any other questions? I'm not sure how this is going to come out. <laughs> there seems to be, you know, whether it's the goblin illustrating the story or whether it's the artistic, sorry, visual interpretation of data, or whether it's almost the gamification of our engagement with animals and, and the other non-human beings in our world. You, you all sort of have this ability through digital to, to, to take this story and bring it to life. If you didn't have digital, if you had to work in a traditional art medium, would it be impacted? Would it be as powerful or would it just simply be different? 
I mean, to be honest, I think I would probably just not make art. <laughs> I would, um, I don't know what I would do, actually. That is shaking my being to my core. Um, I would, <laughs> I don't know, I'd probably, probably just do like fantasy illustration and like attempt to like replace the like lost, um, you know, kind of uh, potential of the digital world and the ability to kind of explore and find insane things um, with my own insane fantastical thought. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's, <laughs> I don't know how, how well that would be impacted. Um, my impact, I think, but yeah, it would definitely change my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Great question. Um, I think I actually come from a background in creative writing. And I think that what each of us does here really in a way is, is we're storytellers. And so I think in that way, writing and art are quite similar. And um, this, this kind of everything that's happened um, with the digital world has impacted writing as well. And so for me, starting off as a writer telling stories and then realizing, oh, I don't just have to use text. I can use images. I can use sound. I can have people um, play with it and touch it and or they can create their own story from it. Um, I think that's sort of something that's, that's impacted me along the way. Um, so yeah, I don't know what I would be doing otherwise, <laughs> crying, <laughs> crying in bed, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> crying with the dog, uh, yeah. <laughs> so good. Great question. It got me thinking about, um, is a body of exceptional landscape painting doing the same thing? Is it different? Um, yeah, I'll continue thinking about that. It's fascinating. Anything else out there before we wrap it up for today? All righty. Thank you, everybody. That's been great. It's been illuminating. It's been, um, it's made me want to go and do more reading, which is <laughs> always good. Um, I want to say thank you to TAFE Queensland and thank you to Study Gold Coast for putting this on. Uh, a big thank you for Renee Belton here at Hodder for making it actually happen and run and the whole team here. Have a great afternoon.